In the previous sections, we saw how Hamiltonian mechanics coincides with determinism and reversibility. In this section, we are going to see how this generalizes to multiple degrees of freedom. Since we're going to work in a six-dimensional space, it's going to be a little bit more tricky to visualize and understand what's going on, but we can still do something. Let's start with the equations. And so we have three pairs of equation for the three degrees of freedom, x, y, and z. The first thing that we want to do is to um, introduce a notation that allows us to work with the math a little bit more easily and more generally. So the first thing that we are going to do is going to name the three directional space as x1, x2, x3 with an index i. So we just substitute the variable and now since these three equations are formally the same, we can just write them in terms of xi and pi. So this pair of equation, actually each of these equations represents three equations, one for each degree of freedom. Now everything we're going to do, instead of writing d, dt, and del, del p like this, we're going to write it in a more compact form. So this dt means the derivative in time, this del p is the derivative in pi, and this del xi is the derivative in xi. So these are still the same equation that we had uh, before, just written in a little bit more of a compact form. We're going to introduce uh, the s vector so that the s xi is going to be equal to the derivative of t in xi and s pi is going to be equal to the derivative of t in pi. And what we note here is that this side of the equation, the variables uh, here and the variables here are the same, so this we can sort of write it in even in a more generalized way but we don't have a match for the left part. So to make it easier for, to write the equation later, we introduce another way to describe the S vector field. We are, we are going to introduce this lower component, and we'll have this relationship that S upper X is only going to be equal to S lower P, and S upper P is going to be equal to minus S lower X. And now also on the right side, we have uh, the, the p matching the p and the x matching the x, so that also this part can be now written in a more general form. What we still need to do is to find, an, uh, to find another way to write this middle part, the, the cross relationship. We're going to introduce a Greek letter for indices, like alpha and beta, gamma, delta, and each of these can take any direction in phase space. Uh, x, x1, p1, x2, p2, and we order them in this way. When we introduce this uh, uh, matrix, uh, omega, alpha, beta, where the alpha are going to come from this side and the beta are going to come from this side, and we're going to, to set them as one if we're starting from the x and we're ending in p, x and p, and we're going to set them as minus one if we're going starting from p and we're going to come to x. So we have this matrix that is basically mostly zero except one and minus one. In terms of this matrix, we can write that S upper alpha times omega alpha beta is equal to S lower beta. And this equation corresponds to those two equations that we had before for the cross X and P term. How does it work? Well, suppose that I put Xi here. The only term that is non-zero for the xi is going to be the corresponding pi. So we're going to have the s xi times omega xi pi is equal to s pi. And this omega is going to be equal to 1. So that equation, if we put an x1, xi here, is going to correspond to this part of the equation. If we put uh, pi here instead, the only term that is going to be non-zero is the one where we start from the pi and end uh, on the xi of the same degree of freedom. So this is going to give us a minus one and uh, it will force the beta to be xi. So we're going, it's going to give us this relationship. Now, what does this mean in a more uh, geometrical term? is that when we're passing from the upper indices to the lower indices, you can see here we're doing a 90 degree rotation on each of the degree of freedom. 
the x goes to the p and the p goes to the minus x. That's a 90 degree of uh, rotation. If you remember, that's what was happening for the, for the single uh, degree of freedom case. Now, in terms of the alphas, we can write all the equations that we had before. We can say that the s upper alpha is the change in phase space. It's going to be the derivative of the trajectory in time. So it gives us the vector that it's tangent to the curve and tells us where we're moving in the trajectory. The s lower alpha, instead, is the gradient of h. It's telling us where h is increasing in phase space. And the relationship between the upper alpha and the lower alpha is the 90 degree rotation. So the change in phase space is the gradient rotated 90 degree along each degree of freedom. So we're going to do one rotation for each degree of freedom. So we kind of have an idea for the math now. We still don't know how the flow and the conservation of area are going to map into multiple degrees of freedom. We'll, we'll see that later. Right now, we'll see how the uh, thermodynamics approach generalizes, because it's the easiest one to do. So if you remember, we said that uh, um, if uh, the system is deterministic and uh, reversible, the state at any point in time is a function of the state at any one time. This also means that the state the, is, is a function of only the system and not of anything else. Therefore, deterministic and reversible system is isolated. There is no energy that is lost or gained. For each uh, independent degree of freedom, we assume that uh, the amount of energy lost or gained by each uh, degree of freedom while uh, uh, where we're moving across our trajectory can be calculated independently so that the total of the energy is going to be the sum of the energy lost and gained for each degree of freedom separately. So how does this work mathematically? We're going to say that the uh, exchange energy is going to be zero and uh, uh, if we take any pa closed path along a phase space and we calculate the energy uh, lost or gained this has to be zero. The infinitesimal element of energy can be uh, divided into kinetic and work. Since we said uh, that the total energy is just the sum of each degree of freedom, here we just have the sum of all the degree of freedom. So we have VdP minus F dx. This is the kinetic term, and this is the amount of work done against the system. V is going to be dx dt, and F is going to be dp dt the dx dt correspond to the s upper x and the dp dt is going to be it's going to correspond to the s upper p now we use our omega to bring down the component so we transform s upper x into s lower p and we transform the s upper p to minus s lower x and now you see that the that the coordinates now match here, the labels match. So we can rewrite this as just s lower alpha d alpha. And this is just uh, the line integral of uh, uh, s alpha along any curve, and that's going to be zero. So in terms of the lower alpha, what we're saying is that the curl of the lower, of the s lower alpha is going to be zero. So the derivative uh, uh, in alpha of s beta minus the derivative in beta of s alpha is equal to zero. If the curl of s lower alpha is zero, then it means that we can write it in terms of a potential. So we can write that s lower alpha is the gradient of an h. And then this combined with the previous equation give us the Hamilton equation for multiple degrees of freedom. So we saw that that um, that approach generalizes very easily and it's easy to understand. So we can sort of remap what we have. We still don't know exactly what happens to the flux and, uh, and uh, the area, but we have seen that the thermodynamic part generalizes. And then in the next section, we'll have to see how the measurement, the information theory, and the state mapping generalizes to multiple degree of freedom.